Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we will be finishing our analysis of the pre-released Elaine chapter from The Winds of Winter. In Parts 1 and 2, we went through the first parts of the chapter, where we see Elaine deal with Sweet Robin, and then go in search of her father. Along the way, she bumps into some key players in the Vale. Specifically, she encounters Miranda Royce, who helps her look for Littlefinger and absolutely seems to be up to something, as well as Anya Wainwood and her son and grandson, Shadrick the Mad Mouse, who almost certainly knows that she's actually Sansa Stark, and last but not least, Harry the Heir. Coming up in this video, we will continue our journey with Elaine as she, at last, finds her father, who gives her some important advice regarding Harry the Heir and conclude with Sansa putting into motion some of these words of wisdom. So, let's do this. All three Wainwoods looked at him askance. You are a guest here, Harry, Lady Anya reminded him in a frosty voice. See that you remember that. A lady's armor is her courtesy. Elaine could feel the blood rushing to her face. No tears, she prayed. Please, please, I must not cry. As you wish, sir. And now, if you will excuse me, Littlefinger's bastard must find her lord father and let him know that you have come so we can begin the tourney on the morrow and may your horse stumble harry the heir so you fall on your stupid head in your first tilt she showed the wainwoods a stone face as they blurted out awkward apologies for their companion when they were done she turned and fled near the keep she ran headlong into sir lothor brune and almost knocked him off his feet. Harry the heir? Harry the arse, I say. He's just some up-jumped squire. Elaine was so grateful that she hugged him. Thank you. Have you seen my father, sir? Down in the vaults, Sir Lothar said, inspecting Lord Nestor's granaries with Lord Grafton and Lord Belmore. The vaults were large and dark and filthy, Elaine lit a taper and clutched her skirt as she made the descent. Near the bottom, she heard Lord Grafton's booming voice and followed. The merchants are clamoring to buy, and the lords are clamoring to sell, the Gulltowner was saying when she found them. Though not a tall man, Grafton was wide, with thick arms and shoulders. His hair was a dirty blonde mop. How am I to stop that, my lord? Post guardsmen on the docks, if need be, seize the ships. How does not matter, so long as no food leaves the Vale. These prices, though, contested fat Lord Belmore. These prices are more than fair. You say more than fair, my lord. I say less than we would wish. Wait, if need be, buy the food yourself and keep it stored. Winter is coming. Prices must go higher. Perhaps, said Belmore doubtfully, Bronze Yan will not wait, Grafton complained. He need not ship through Gulltown. He has ports of his own. Whilst we are hoarding our harvest, Royce and the other lords' declarant will turn theirs into silver. You may be sure of that. Let us hope so, said Peter. When their granaries are empty, they will need every scrap of that silver to buy sustenance from us. And now... If you will excuse me, my lord, it would seem my daughter has need of me. Lady Elaine, Lord Grafton said, you look bright-eyed this morning. You were kind to say so, my lord. Father, I am sorry to disturb you, but I thought you would want to know that the Wainwoods have arrived. And is Sir Harold with them? Horrible, Sir Harold. He is, Lord Belmore laughed. I never thought Royce would let him come. Is he blind or merely stupid? He is honorable. Sometimes it amounts to the same thing. 
If he denied the lad the chance to prove himself, it could create a rift between them, so why not let him tilt? The boy is skilled enough to win a place amongst the winged knights. I suppose not, said Belmore grudgingly. Lord Grafton kissed Elaine on the hand, and the two lords went off, leaving her alone with her lord father. Come, Peter said. Walk with me. He took her by the arm and led her deeper into the vaults, past an empty dungeon. And how was your first meeting with Harry the heir? He's horrible. The world is full of horrors, sweet. By now you ought to know that. You've seen enough of them. Yes, she said. But why must he be so cruel? He called me your bastard. Right in the yard, in front of everyone. So far as he knows, that's who you are. This betrothal was never his idea, and Bronze Jan has no doubt warned him against my wiles. You are my daughter. He does not trust you, and he believes that you are beneath him. Well, I'm not. He may think he's some great knight, but Sir Lothor says he's just some up-jumped squire. Peter put his arm around her. So he is, but he is Robert's heir as well. Bringing Harry here was the first step in our plan, but now we need to keep him, and only you can do that. He has a weakness for a pretty face, and whose face is prettier than yours? Charm him, entrance him, bewitch him. I don't know how, she said miserably. Oh, I think you do, said Littlefinger, with one of those smiles that did not reach his eyes. You will be the most beautiful woman in the hall tonight, as lovely as your lady mother at your age. I cannot seat you on the dais, but you'll have a place of honor above the salt and underneath a wall sconce. The fire will be shining in your hair, so everyone will see how fair a face you are. Keep a good long spoon on hand to beat the squires off, sweetling. You will not want green boys underfoot when the knights come round to beg you for your favor. Who would ask to wear a bastard's favor? Harry, if he has the wits God gave a goose. But do not give it to him. Choose some other gallant and favor him instead. You do not want to seem too eager. No, Elaine said. Lady Wainwood will insist that Harry dance with you. I can promise you that much. That will be your chance. Smile at the boy. Touch him when you speak. Tease him to pique his pride. If he seems to be responding, tell him that you are feeling faint and ask him to take you outside for a breath of fresh air. No knight could refuse such a request from a fair maiden. Yes, she said, but he thinks that I'm a bastard. A beautiful bastard, and the Lord Protector's daughter. Peter drew her close and kissed her on both cheeks. The knight belongs to you, sweetling. Remember that. Always. I'll try, father, she said. So, this video picks up right after Harry the heir's gallant introduction, as he was immediately chastised by the Wainwoods, who are likely anxious to see this marriage go through, because they likely need the dowry Littlefinger offered them just to service the debt that they have, which Littlefinger just so happened to buy up right before he propositioned the Wainwoods for this marriage. Elaine was clearly hurt by his attitude towards her, which is a little odd considering that she isn't even really a bastard, resulting in her giving him quite the attitude back and turning to leave. Then she bumps into Lothar Brun, who apparently doesn't think much of Harry and actually did know where Littlefinger was, and he tells her that he can be found in the vaults going through the granaries. Elaine finds Littlefinger talking to the lords Belmore and Grafton about the Vale's food supply, and it appears that Littlefinger knows something that the rest of the Vale Lords don't. Every Lord in the Vale seems to have a lot of surplus food, since their fields were untouched by the wars and they didn't have to use any of it to feed armies. They're sitting in a position where they believe that they have way more food than they need for the upcoming winter, and are therefore anxious to sell their goods to the rest of the realm for a hefty profit. But Littlefinger wants to forbid it, and is even willing to buy up the entirety of the surplus himself to ensure that none of it leaves the Vale. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? In the past, 
We've said that we believe Littlefinger is one of the single most evil individuals in the series, and is quite possibly an agent of the Great Other. He started wars that drastically weakened the realm and depleted its food supplies right before the upcoming Long Night. It could be that Littlefinger is preparing for a much longer winter than the rest of the Vale Lords because he knows that this winter isn't going to be of the like that the realm has seen in millennia. Or at the very least, it certainly seems possible. The next noteworthy thing that happens in this exchange is the somewhat curious statement from Lord Belmore when he confirmed Harry the Heir's presence at the tourney. I never thought Royce would let him come. Is he blind or merely stupid? The heck does that mean? We commiserated about this all week, and the only thing we could think of is Harry's presence was sure to upset Sweet Robin, which of course it did, but Littlefinger had a different take. He said that Royce invited Harry because he's honorable, and that not doing so would cause a rift between him and the heir to the Vale. Which, of course, on the surface seems logical, but this is Littlefinger we're talking about here. Littlefinger never tells people what he actually thinks. The reality is most likely that Littlefinger made that exact case to Royce and sort of coerced Nestor into inviting Harry so he could get Harry and Sansa into the same room. It also seems likely that Littlefinger would like Harry to earn a pair of wings at this tourney. It would give him the opportunity to gain leverage over Harry. Think about it. What if, for the sake of argument, Sweet Robin was to die when Harry was on guard duty. Everyone in the Vale would be thinking that Harry killed John Aaron's son so he could have the Vale. That would give Littlefinger the ability to sort of swoop in and save him. Then, when you add the fact that Elaine is actually Sansa Stark, and marrying Harry to her would give him a claim to the North, that's the sort of thing that would give Littlefinger long-standing sway with Harry which is important because once Sweet Robin's gone, Littlefinger has no on-paper authority in the Vale. After Lords Grafton and Belmore take their leave, Littlefinger and Elaine discuss her first encounter with Harry, where she tells him that Harry was straight-up rude. Littlefinger isn't surprised, and pretty much points out that most people suck, which is a hard truth to swallow, but reality nonetheless. He goes on to give her advice on how to play it with Harry. Using one of his famous rules, which is, once you know what a person wants, you know who they are and how to move them, he explains to her that Harry is actually pretty simple. He has a weakness for pretty faces. And whatever else Sansa might be, she does have a pretty face. He tells her that that will be enough to get his attention. Well, that and the fact that Lady Anya will almost certainly insist that they dance. Then, once she's with him, he tells her to smile touch him when they speak, and tease him to prick his pride. His last bit of advice was for Sansa to refuse to give him her favor. So, let's see how this little bird did enacting the things Littlefinger told her to do. The feast proved to be everything her father promised. Sixty-four dishes were served, in honor of the sixty-four competitors who had come so far to contest for silver wings before their lord. From the rivers and the lakes came pike and trout and salmon. From the seas, crabs and cod and herring. Ducks there were, and capons, peacocks in their plumage, and swans in almond milk. Suckling pigs were served up crackling with apples in their mouths and three huge aurochs were roasted whole above fire pits in the castle yard, since they were too big to get through the kitchen doors. Loaves of hot bread filled the trestle tables in Lord Nestor's hall, and massive wheels of cheese were brought up from the vaults. The butter was fresh churned, and there were leeks and carrots, roasted onions, beets, turnips, parsnips. And best of all, Lord Nestor's cooks prepared a splendid subtlety, a lemon cake in the shape of the giant's lance, twelve feet tall and adorned with an eerie made of sugar. For me, Elaine thought, as they wheeled it out. Sweet Robin loved lemon cakes too, 
but only after she told him that they were her favorites. The cake had required every lemon in the veil, but Peter had promised that he would send to Dorn for more. There were gifts as well, splendid gifts. Each of the competitors received a cloak of cloth of silver and a lapis brooch in the shape of a pair of falcon's wings. Fine steel daggers were given to the brothers, fathers, and friends who had come to watch them tilt. For their mothers, sisters, and ladies fair, there were bolts of silk and mirish lace. Lord Nestor has an open hand, Elaine heard Sir Edmund Breakstone say. An open hand and a little finger, Lady Wainwood replied, with a nod toward Peter Baelish. Breakstone was not slow to take her meaning. The true source of this largesse was not Lord Nestor, but the Lord Protector. When the last course had been served and cleared, the tables were lifted from their trestles to clear the floor for dancing, and musicians were brought in. Are there no singers? asked Ben Coldwater. The little lord cannot abide them, Sir Lyman Linderley replied. Not since Marillion. Ah, that was the man who murdered Lady Liza, yes. Elaine spoke up. His singing pleased her greatly, and she showed him too much favor, perhaps. When she wed my father, he went mad and pushed her out the moon door. Lord Robert has hated singing ever since. He is still fond of music, though. As am I, Coldwater said. Rising, he offered Elaine his hand. Would you honor me with this dance, my lady? You're very kind, she said as he led her to the floor. He was her first partner of the evening, but far from the last. Just as Peter had promised, the young knights flocked around her, vying for her favor. After Ben came Andrew Tollett, handsome Sir Byron, red-nosed Sir Morgarth, and Sir Shadrich the Mad Mouse. Then Sir Albar Royce, Miranda's stout, dull brother and Lord Nestor's heir. She danced with all three Sunderlands, none of whom had webs between their fingers, though she could not vouch for their toes. Uther Shedd appeared to pay her slimy compliments as he trod upon her feet, but Sir Targon the Half-Wild proved to be the soul of courtesy. After that, Sir Roland Wainwood swept her up and made her laugh with mocking comments about half the other knights in the hall. His uncle Wallace took a turn as well and tried to do the same, but the words would not come. Elaine finally took pity on him and began to chatter happily to spare him the embarrassment. When the dance was done, she excused herself and went back to her place to have a drink of wine. And there he stood, Harry the heir himself, tall, handsome, scowling. Lady Elaine, may I partner you in this dance? She considered for a moment. No. I don't think so. Color rose to his cheeks. I was unforgivably rude to you in the yard. You must forgive me. Must? She tossed her hair, took a sip of wine, and made him wait. How can you forgive someone who is unforgivably rude? Will you explain that to me, sir? Sir Harold looked confused. Please, one dance. Charm him. Entrance him. Bewitch him. If you insist, he nodded, offered his arm, led her out onto the floor. As they waited for the music to resume, Elaine glanced to the dais, where Lord Robert sat staring at them. Please, she prayed, don't let him start to twitch and shake. Not here. Not now. Maester Coleman would have made certain that he drank a strong dose of sweet milk before the feast, but even so. Then the musicians took up a tune, and she was dancing. Say something, she urged herself. You will never make Sir Harry love you if you don't have the courage to talk to him. 
Should she tell him what a good dancer he was? No, he's probably heard that a dozen times tonight. Besides, Peter said that I should not seem eager. Instead, she said, I have heard that you are about to be a father. It was not something most girls would say to their almost betrothed, but she wanted to see if Sir Harold would lie. For the second time. My daughter Alice is two years old. Your bastard daughter Alice, Elaine thought. But what she said was, That one had a different mother, though. Yes. Sissy was a pretty thing when I tumbled her. But childbirth has left her fat as a cow, so Lady Anya arranged for her to marry one of her men-at-arms. It is different with Saffron. Saffron? Elaine tried not to laugh. Truly, Sir Harold had the grace to blush. Her father says she is more precious to him than gold. He's rich, the richest man in Gulltown, a fortune in spices. What will you name the babe? she asked. Cinnamon if she's a girl, cloves if he's a boy. That almost made him stumble. My lady japes. Oh, no. Peter will howl when I tell him what I said. Saffron is very beautiful, I'll have you know. Tall and slim, with big brown eyes and hair like honey. Elaine raised her head. More beautiful than me? Sir Harold studied her face. You were comely enough, I grant you. When Lady Anya first told me of this match, I was afraid you might look like your father. Little pointy beard and all? Elaine laughed. I never meant. I hope you joust better than you talk. For a moment he looked shocked, but as the song was ending, he burst into a laugh. No one told me you were clever. He has good teeth, she thought, straight and white. And when he smiles, he has the nicest dimples. She ran one finger down his cheek. Should we ever wed, you'll have to send Saffron back to her father. I'll be all the spice you'll want. He grinned. I will hold you to that promise, my lady. Until that day, may I wear your favor in the tourney? You may not. It is promised to another. She was not sure who as yet, but she knew she would find someone. Okay, so this last part leaves us in a position where we don't really know how well this went. When you first read it, it seems like Sansa played Harry like a fiddle, but given the fact that the Waynewoods almost certainly lit into him for the way that he treated her when they first met, it's very difficult to tell whether Sansa was successful here or if he was just trying to be on his best behavior in an attempt to redeem himself in his mother figure's eyes. It does seem like Harry was surprised that she had a brain, which indicates that he had previously heard that she wasn't particularly bright, whether that was something that intrigued him or not is not yet clear. This scene does really give us the impression that Harry is dumb, as he was just seemingly outwitted by Sansa, who isn't likely to get nominated for Mensa anytime soon. But without more to go on, like I said, it's impossible to tell whether he was just thrown off his game by having to pretend to be nice to someone that he didn't want to be nice to, while at the same time being shocked that the girl that he was told was dumb said something clever. The other really important tidbit that needs mentioning is the fact that Sansa noted that Sweet Robin was, once again, given a strong dose of sweet sleep prior to the feast, in spite of the fact that Maester Coleman straight up told her that giving him more might kill him if they don't wait at least half a year. Once again, reinforcing the fact that Sweet Robin is not long for this world, and Sansa doesn't care. So, in summary... This chapter had a lot of interesting aspects in it. Miranda Royce is an interesting character and definitely has Sansa wrapped around her little finger. The introduction of Harry the Heir has added a lot of intrigue. The fact that this plotline contains Littlefinger 
and a bunch of Vale Lords that we know next to nothing about makes the prospect of getting more information on this even more exciting, to the point that we just cannot wait to get more. But until next time, stay tuned, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand. Thank you.